Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Tea Time Tuesday. Um, before we get into our lesson, let's go ahead and have some prayer. Lord God, I just thank you uh, for each and every single one of these women who are listening in on tonight. I pray, God, that you continue to open up our minds and our hearts to your word, give us guidance, give us clarity as we come together to just seek a better understanding of your word, Lord God. I pray that someone will get a word on tonight. And Lord, I pray that you will guide me and lead me and help me to teach this word in a way that is pleasing and acceptable unto you, that it could be understood and comprehended by all those who are listening. In Jesus' name I pray, thank God, and amen. Ooh, um, you know, y'all, I don't know, but lately I've had, like, constant um, anxiety. So, like, even now, um, it's not as bad as it was, like, last week. But it's just, like I said, it's just constant, like a constant wave of anxiety. So if you could just remember to pray with me. On that, like, whenever, you know, the Lord puts you on my mind, just to say a prayer for that, because, yeah, um, it's something. So, um, going back, right, we're looking at Proverbs 4, right, we're turning back to our lesson. Now, for those of you who know, right, um, we stopped, I took a break to do the, the heart to heart, but we we're coming back to our reading, which you know, it's more or less not our lesson on Proverbs 4, verse 6. And we're looking at those four verbs, right? Forsake, forsake, preserve, love, and keep in the King James Version, right? Forsake, preserve, love, and keep. Okay. And, you know, just because I want to make sure that um, I read the scripture because I, I feel it's important. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to read it in the King James. Again, this is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6. King James Version. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6, King James. And, you know, just for clarity's sake, uh, I want to also read it in the Amplified. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to do that. Now I can get it to pull up. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6. Oop, that's not the one I need. Amplified version. It says, do not turn away from her wisdom and she will guard and protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6, Amplified. Um, so for this, right, because I studied using, um, you know, the draws exhaustive expanded concordance, I'm going to mainly come from the, the King James this time, but you know, we'll, we do have some other translations that I use to study this. So. Just a reminder for those who maybe don't or do or don't know, right? Uh, I gave the ladies the assignment of looking up those four verbs in this verse forsake, preserve, love, and keep, right? In the amplified, turn away, guard, protect, oh, guard and protect, that's one phrase, that's one Greek word. Guard and protect. Love, watch over. Turn away, guard and protect. Love, watch over. Okay? Look at those four verbs and, you know, study it, find out what it means, and it, that's how it became published. <laughs> but, um, you know, going back and realizing, like, okay, we need to, I need to take time to really explain it right? Uh, sometimes I think some of the struggles is that 
And I feel like I've mentioned it before, you know, God will start revealing things to me in his word, and it's a lot. <laughs> so it's like, oh, man, I get so excited. But at the same time, it can be hard for me to, like, get that information out. So this time, you know, I really sat down, um, you know, I really meditated on this verse to really look at not even, you know, we're still doing that comparison, right, what's being forsaken, okay? But this time, rather than looking at, okay, what's being forsaken, what's not being forsaken, the Lord's like, just look at what's being forsaken, right? Let's look at this word forsaken or forsake and just notice the things that are that's happening here and make those comparisons and contrast there, right? So I want to go back a little bit and just take time, like I said, to do those comparisons and to kind of make the connections I feel like better <laughs> than what I did last time instead of just kind of throwing verses. So that's what I want to do uh, tonight. So again, looking at our main verse, right, Proverbs 4 and 6. I'm going to forsake her not. Um, be mindful. I think we've, I've covered that before, right, how Proverbs was really written to young men, okay? So you notice that wisdom is being personified as a woman. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Right? Like, you should love wisdom, specifically wisdom of the Lord, right, more than anything else. So for us as women, right, it's like you should pursue wisdom and desire wisdom more than than anything else. Like, Like, true wisdom comes from God, and we have to get to a place where we see him as our husband before we even have a husband. Right, if you already have a husband, then it's like God is still, like He's still your husband over your husband. So there should be that desire there to like embrace wisdom, right? But forsake her not, right? In my, I have some comparisons, right? In the ESV, do not forsake her. Like, don't turn away, right? Don't turn away from wisdom. Um, first comparison, the first thing we know to write was in Genesis. So let's go back there again. Genesis chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 24. Again, in Genesis chapter 2, at verse 24, almost at chapter 24, y'all, <laughs> Jackie is tired. <laughs> and again, I'll read it from both translations, so first King James and then the Amplified. Therefore shall a man leave, and that is Azab, right, our, our Hebrew word here. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, King James. Amplified version reads, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Amplified version. So, really meditating on this verse, right, the thing that, you know, God was showing me today is like, yeah, there's times where you're going to have to leave your family, right? Um, And it's interesting, like, I had a conversation with somebody uh, kind of similar this week um, that we're both the kind of people where it's like you love your family, um, you're really big on family. It's like, I don't want to, you know, but at the same time, and maybe it's just that season where it's like, God is like, all right, I need to have the Abraham moment with you where I'm separating you from your family 
that I can make many nations, you know, in you. And it's like, thank God, my family. <laughs> and so, again, it's like, note here, right? Forsake not wisdom. Don't turn away from wisdom. Don't leave, depart from wisdom. But yet we're leaving family. And again, I feel like I have to, you know, to clarify, right? It's always good to have wise counsel. I feel like that is a common thing that is constantly advised to married couples. Like, don't just find other uh, married people to befriend or whatever. You also need to have, you know, married friends who, one, they have a healthy relationship. They're, they're strong in their faith, right? But you have an older couple, too, who can mentor you, right? Um, kind of be there for, like, guidance and those things. And that's, that's totally okay. Like, your family's always going to be there. They always love your family. But it does get to a point where it's like, okay, I have to take a step back. You know, um, the family, your family can become like a, a distraction in some ways, and in some cases, an anchor. It's like the reason why you haven't moved forward is because of your family. Um, and I mean, that can be, some of us have some complex relationships with our family, right? Like, not everybody comes from a big, happy household. Some people literally come from dysfunction, where it's like you have people that are intentionally just hateful or malicious or whatever, and they really are not trying to see you succeed. And it's like, but we're family, though. You know, or you start doing better than them, and now... Like, oh, you see that? Now they think they're better than everybody. What are you talking about? <laughs> so then they start causing discord between the other family members and you, and it's like, but no, ain't nobody talked to me. Nobody asked me, but you talk to other people to tell you what I said, and, and it's stuff I've never said. Like, what are you talking about? And so it's just like, yeah, there gets a time where, yeah, he needs you to kind of to just take a step back. Like I said, we don't just completely just abandon people, although, you know, depending on the situation, you never know. It's like also consider the context of this verse, right? It's a marriage. Like we said last time, you know, there's going to be a time where it's like, yeah, this this is your union and, and you have to protect that covenant. And sometimes you're going to have to protect that covenant from people in your own family. So Abraham had to leave his family, you know. And I feel like that's also a constant thing that you see in the Bible where God calls somebody and then you see this kind of slow separation. (laughs) And again, it's like God drawing them closer and closer to himself and moving them and positioning them in a space where they can go on to do these great things. And it not only benefits you know, their their family, but all of God's family, right? So it's just something to to be mindful of, right? So forsake not wisdom, but then we're leaving father and mother, right? And remember, this word, azab, that's the Hebrew word, azab, is not just like forsaking or leaving something. It can mean a loosening, right? You could even look at our first, our primary verse, Proverbs 4 and 6, and you could say, like, do not loosen away from uh, wisdom, right? Or just like it says in the Amplified, don't turn away from that. Now, the next verse that we looked at was 7, or I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah. Chapter 7, and then verse 16. Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 16. Now, this one, I actually did go back 
think I did some reading. Okay. I'm trying to see where where I saw it in here. We can start about I'm trying to make sure I find well, we can start on like verse ten. We need to read a little bit more. So we'll start at verse ten. And then we'll read down to sixteen. Okay. This is still Isaiah, (laughs) Isaiah chapter 7, but we're going to start at verse 10 and then read down to verse 16. Okay, now for this one, I'm just going to read from the Amplified, okay? Isaiah chapter 7, starting at verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to King Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God, one that will convince you that God has spoken and will keep his word. Make your request as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too small a thing for you to try the patience of men, but will you try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Listen carefully. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land Canaan, whose two kings you dread, will be deserted, both Ephraim and Haram. That is Isaiah chapter 7. Verses 10 through 16, Amplified Version. So this word, right, somebody will be deserted. Now in the King James, looking at verse 16, it says the word forsaken, right? So before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken, Azab, of both her kings. And I think we mentioned it too, right? At this point in time, uh, you know, Israel, they stray away. I mean, when we think about it, that is our nature. We have a tendency, we just go through the cycle, right? It's like you're up when you're up, and then, you know, you're down. You got to get back up. Okay. So they're having one of those moments in Isaiah. We see like his judgment coming down on his people because of this wickedness that has been going on. Okay. So they're facing the consequences of their sin, right? And Ahaz, in this chapter, hears about uh, one of the 12 tribes has lined up with two of their enemies to fight against them. And so, you know, the people become disheartened. It's like, oh, wow. Like, again, it's one thing when uh, you have people that you know don't like you. It's like, hey, they're coming out for you. It's another thing when the people who are supposed to be in your corner are, are basically turning against you too, right? And so, like I said, they become disheartened at the news, and then that's when God sends Isaiah to speak to them, right? And it's funny because we're not supposed to ask the Lord for for signs and wonders, but in this case, the Lord is like, hey, ask for a sign. Well, I'm not going to test the Lord. It's like the Lord telling you (laughs) anywhere, right? So here... I, again, looking at that verse, and it's just like, okay, but, you know, it's like by the time Christ comes, because, again, there, he's prophesizing about Jesus Christ. We see that in verse 14, right? And, again, this is King James. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Right? They're prophesizing about Jesus Christ. 
And so literally the Lord showed me, it's like, you know, you might have an enemy, an adversary, who's in a position of power or whatever, and they're coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. But just know, like, and he literally telling his people, like, by the time my son come on the scene, they're not even going to be here. They're going to be vacated. They're going to be vacated up out of that out of that position, right? The land that thou poor shall be forsaken of both her kings. They both going to be gone. I'm going to handle that. And remember that in this context, right, this word here means to be completely gone, completely forsaken. So it's like it's not forever, right? It's not forever. It doesn't matter like what, you know, because remember that Satan is our adversary. He's our enemy. It's like it doesn't matter what he's coming at you with. Be mindful, right, that it's only for us. It's only for a season. It's only for a moment in time. But there's going to come a day where it's like, oh, I'm not even going to have <laughs> to deal with this anymore, you know, because you won't be up out of here. And it's like, wouldn't it be amazing? This is literally what the Lord, the Lord telling me. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had that same attitude towards Satan? That when he's coming at you, you know, with that anxiety, with fear, with worry, with doubt, or whatever it is, when he's coming at you, that you turn around and you're like, boy, you're going to be in the lake of fire. <laughs> like, you're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. You're going to be destroyed. Yeah, you got your little position right now, but you ain't going to have that position forever because there's going to be a day where you're going to be gone. <laughs> that spot is going to be vacant. It's going to be empty. <laughs> You know, I literally watched a, a listen to a podcast today on suffering. And the thing that really, like, really listening to the past message, it really was, I'm like, yeah, suffering is constant. As long as we're on this earth, you're going to be having to deal with something. Like, this was something that was kind of ingrained in the, in the people, at the, God's people at this time. And again, it's not a pessimistic attitude like, oh, I'm going to, you know, there's no point in me being happy or at taking heart or being joyful about anything because I'm going to have to deal with something else. That wasn't the attitude. The attitude was like, yeah, you know what, this is this is going to be a constant thing, but I don't have to go through this by myself because God acknowledges my suffering. He acknowledges my pain. And he's walking with that thing with me. And because he's walking through the suffering and through the pain with me, I can have joy. I can rejoice in that. Even when I'm angry, when it's hard. You know, and he referenced the book of Psalms. He's like, why did we need 150 of them? You know, you talk about emotions and things. We could have stopped at 10, (laughs) you know. Is like, and the reason why you have so many is just that that reminder, like, God can take your anger. He can handle your, your fears and your doubts. He's not afraid of those things. When it's like, God, I understand that you called this person home, but I still don't understand why. Or why in this way. Like, God, I know that this is just for a season, but wow, does it really have to be like this? Right, which then leads to our next verse. Isaiah, we're still in Isaiah. And again, we're looking at Isaiah 54. This is the chapter we're looking at this time. Isaiah 54, uh, specifically verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 54, verses 6 and 7. And again, I'm going to read from the two translations. Well, no, I'm not. I'm going to read from King James. Sorry. I'll be honest. Like, so lately, there's that little voice that's like, do it this way. Okay. And sometimes it'd be like right in that moment. And so it's just like, all right, I'm going to just do it. 
he said in that moment. Okay. So this time King James. And again, this is Isaiah 54, verses 6 and 7. For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. Isaiah 54, verses 6 and 7 in James Version. So remember, right, I, I told y'all last time how I looked at that verse. I'm like, for a small moment I have forsaken thee. My God, what does that mean? And I took time to actually go study that verse. And look, now I'm getting emotional because, man, thinking about what I just said, right, or what even what I just learned today and then reflecting back again on what he taught me reading this verse, studying it. Remember, like, God does not break his promises. So when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he means that. Right? One of the illustrations that God gave me is the imagery of, you know, when you have a a little child, maybe like they're a toddler, maybe like two or three years old or something, like a little bitty baby, a little bitty child. And you put them in in a room, right? And so as long as that door is open, they're happy, they're smiling, y'all, you giggling and laughing and, you know, but then it's like you close the door and they start, they burst into tears, they start crying, they're hollering. You never left. You're still right there. The door's just closed. Right? You open the door back up, now they're happy again. They're laughing and giggling. And so it's like, yeah, you thought I left you. There are times where you feel like I'm not there. Oh, my God. You might feel like I'm not there. You might feel like I've forgotten about you, but I'm still there, right there with you. It's just that the door is closed. And it's like, why is the door closed? I don't know. Sometimes that door might be closed because of sin. Remember, like sin separates us from God. So when we repent, it oh it removes that wall of separation between us and the Lord. Like He's still there. He didn't leave you. He's still there, right? And even in this, we see it twice, right? For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken. And grieved in spirit. Do you understand in this in this time? Now, maybe not quite this time. I'll definitely towards when we start getting towards the New Testament. But women really didn't have any. You mean you talking about didn't have any rights at all? You could not advocate for yourself. You know, if there was some kind of legal dispute, like there had to be some man to come and do that for you, a male relative, so a father, a brother, an uncle, somebody had to come and advocate for you. And then if you were somebody, if you had, you know, you're supposed to get married and then it's like you were just kind of left, like I said, forsaken, rejected, then it's like that shame, it's like the shame was put more on her, like, oh, well, something's been wrong with her. And then you think about that, that we kind of have the similar mentality today. Well, what did she do wrong? She's in an abusive relationship. Well, why didn't she leave? But it never the question of why did you put your hands on her? Why would you do that to to your wife? We still kind of do that today. And so the Lord is sitting there telling them, right, if you read up in this chapter, really just read this chapter. It's a beautiful chapter about us. Like, I still love you. You may feel like, like I said, you might feel like I left you in that moment, but I'm still there. 
So when he's saying, for a small moment I've forsaken thee, that is God's way of acknowledging how they felt. He's acknowledging their pain. He's acknowledging the fact that they felt like, my God, you left us. You just left me. I told you, I was sure with y'all that time where it was like I backslid and I'm begging God, like, God, please don't leave me. He's like, you left me. I've been here the whole time. I'm just waiting on you to come back. And you see that constantly in Isaiah where the Lord's like, I'm waiting for you to come back. Come back to your first love. Come back to your husband. I'm your husband. Come back to me. So, mm, I know I got. I literally I could stay on that. I really could. But it's like I know I got to keep going. I got to keep going. But like I said, it's something to really go and meditate on. Because mm, another lesson that I I really feel like God is trying to teach me in this season is to learn how to be okay with being uncomfortable. Learn how to sit through the suffering. Learn how to sit through that anxiety where sometimes it gets so bad. It's like all you fear is it feels like you're just drowning. You're drowning in fear, or you have moments where you literally are struggling to breathe. It's like, God, I'm terrified, but I'm trusting you because I'm believing that this is in your hands. Like, you feel so far away from me right now, but I'm believing you in your word that when you said you wouldn't leave me, that you're here. And I'm thankful that I serve a God who loves me enough that he acknowledges my feelings where other people have dismissed them. Oh, you just need to get over that. Oh, you're making a big deal about that. You're being too tenderhearted. You're you're too weak. You're too soft. (laughs) My God is gentle and kind. And he's still a powerful, awesome God. Now, the word does tell us, you know, I know in the Amplified, right, to, you know, not be overly sensitive, right? When you take yourself too seriously, you're too high, you're too high strung. Nobody can say anything to you because you don't like any, any little bit of criticism, any little negative comment. You just flip. We don't want to be like that. But we can't be constantly dismissive, like, oh, you just got to suck it up. and move Like, if the Lord could acknowledge their feelings. And mind you, they had a lot going on in Isaiah. <laughs> You're talking about invasion. The, this is when the invasion starts. I believe it's Ezekiel, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, who was there for all three invasions. So it's like, you got a lot going on. What happens during an invasion from an enemy country? It's not a, it's not a tic-tac-toe game. <laughs> you know, my God, where are you? We don't understand. Like, I'm here. I'm gonna redeem you and pull you back to me, but you're gonna have to you gonna have to face these consequences because my standard isn't changing, and it will not change. So let me, okay, let me move on. <laughs> so again, considering that, right? Again, forsake not wisdom. We're leaving father and mother in a marriage and uniting as one in a marriage, right? Our enemies are going to be vacated. That position that they got is going to be forsaken because it, the Lord is going to get them up out of there. It's like, oh, you, by the time, <laughs> by the time Jesus comes on the scene, like, they're not even going to be there. So don't even worry about them people. I got you. And even when you feel like I've left you, I'm still going to be right here for you. It's just for a moment. Because, like, it, that's the other thing i got to point out, right? Now, remember, Isaiah 7 and, 7, uh, 7 and 16, that's that's complete. And when you're talking about complete, like, whoop, it's a done, it's a wrap. 
is over. Versus in this, in Isaiah 54, 6 through 7, that's temporary. It's momentary. It's a season. Now, our version of temporary versus God's version of temporary are two different things. You know, our temporary, like, ooh, five seconds? <laughs> ooh, a few minutes, God? A brief touch and go? Nope. I'm sorry, baby, but you're going to you have to sit through that. You're going to sit through that. I'm telling you, I'm learning that now, and it's hard. So I'm not just I'm not just saying that. <laughs> okay, I understand how difficult that is. You talking about ups and downs? And each time having to come back to the Lord with this hard heart, and to be like, God, I'm forgive me for my hard heart. Please soften it. Please soften my heart, God. Yeah, it, it get rough. I, I understand. But he's still great I am. Now, let's look at this next one, right? This was the last one where we left off from last time, right? Which is Psalms 37, verse 8. Psalm 37, Psalm 37, and then verse 8. And we just got through talking about the Psalms, right? You know, there's some interesting stuff. First thing to remember, the book of Psalms is literally the book of songs. That's what it translates to. So each psalm is a song. And it's interesting when you read some of them psalms and you're like, he's talking about crush my enemies. And, <laughs> you know, imagine singing a, a worship song like that in church. Crush my enemies, <laughs> defeat them, Lord, I'll make them suffer. You know, like, <laughs> wow. You know, I don't know. We want in a church like that, like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on in this church? <laughs> You know, but remember, right, the songs are there to remind us, like, God can take that anger when you want to see somebody be destroyed because you're that angry. Right? And then we have this psalm here. So I'm going to read it in both translations this time. I'm going to start with the Amplified, and I'm going to read the King James. So again, this is Psalm 37, verse 8. Start with Amplified. Cease from anger and abandon wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. Psalm 37, verse 8. Amplified. Now in the King James. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Psalm 37, verse 8, in James Version. So again, we see that word, forsake, azab, and the amplified, abandon, because it can also, azab can also have that meaning, to abandon something. Now, true enough, I did have, I actually took time to look each of those words up, like leave, abandon, forsake, um, loosen like in the English but that's something that you know I'm gonna have to do on my own time because like I said y'all know the way I study now the way God got me studying now it's like a, ooh, you're just going and going and going so I was like okay we just that's gonna be mine for me right but again notice what we we're we're azobbing okay <laughs> where we are to azob Cease from anger and abandon wrath. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Now, that's something that also I want to study on my own because I'm like, you're talking about anger and wrath? What's the difference there? Like, we're not just talking about a regular anger. Wrath, that's some intense anger. That's that we go into jail anger if we don't let Jesus do it. 
Like the girl said in the, I don't even, I haven't yet to see the original TikTok for that, where she was like, I'm going to let Jesus do it, because if I do it, I'm going to jail. That's that wrath. Right? So, again, looking back, just just briefly, right? Do not forsake wisdom. Right? Don't do it. Don't turn away from wisdom. Don't abandon wisdom. Don't leave wisdom behind. Don't you loosen away from this word. Do not forsake her. (laughs) And then what's the interesting thing? She'll protect you. She'll guard you. So it's like the more I hone in on the wisdom of the Lord, the more it protects me and keeps me, it's going to preserve me. But I am to forsake wrath, right? Now, in the King James, for not thyself in evil is to do evil. Like, don't do it. Like, don't you do it, right? Amplify, do not fret, it only leads to evil. So when you sit in there just meditating on it, just stay in there. But isn't it interesting we're supposed to abide in Christ? And how do we do that? By keeping his commandments. We read that in John, right? When we did the John reading. Again, what are you abiding in? Look, I've been that mad a few times in my life. (laughs) And a couple of times tried to act on it. And like I still see that day like it was yesterday. I could not move. When I'm telling you I was in motion to, and I was right there and I could have really hurt this person and I was coming down to hurt them and it felt like I hit this invisible wall, my whole body was still and I could not move. Who do you think that was? And I don't know who that man was praying to. He probably was praying to the Lord. (laughs) I Everything, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that boy was in that moment calling on Jesus because, baby, the Lord, like, this girl about to mess up everything. I can't use you in prison. You're not, gonna, you're not even going to make it. You're too small, and you're not going to make it. <laughs> like, there have been a few times. I'm like, woo, fired up. And I'm like, ooh, and the Lord, like, just be still. Don't move. Because if you move, you're going to get up and you're going to do some damage and you're going to jail. Like, it only leads to evil. King James basically telling us, don't even think about it. Just don't. Just, just don't. Just leave it alone. It's, just, it, it's evil. Don't even think about doing it because it's evil. So it's like, leave this behind. Abandon. Abandon that, right? Now, here's our last verse for forsaken. Now, this one I thought was kind of interesting, right? Let's go to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10. Now, remember, pay attention. You're leaving one thing. We're leaving something is being left, but it's like, look at look at what's being left. Okay? So, again, Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 10. And, again, I'm going to read this time from Amplified first and then King James. Okay. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather its fallen grapes. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10, Amplified Version. And now I'm going to read from King James. 
and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10, King James. So guess where we see Azab here? Thou shalt leave them, thou shalt Azab them. Right in the in the amplified, you shall leave them, you shall absolve them for the poor and for the stranger. Some of the grapes, right? So in other words, the Lord had made it to where even the marginalized people, the people that you don't even think about every day, the homeless, uh, the immigrant, right, the foreigner, like the people who are destitute, the people in a really bad way. Again, people that you you really don't think about. But he cares about them too. Enough to say, hey, when you go and harvest, don't take everything. Like they're supposed to leave the edges, like the the corners, the edges of their crops. Now notice in the Amplified, right, even the fallen grapes, like leave them there so that those who don't have will be able to have something. They can have something to eat, right? But what do you see happening in today's culture, especially, you know, at least for the U.S., right? The way it happens over here, oh, no, I'm I'm taking all of this. I got money to make. Anybody trying to leave leave some food, food behind? They need to get a job. Okay, well, how do you know they ain't been trying? Get you a job. You know, and then when you start looking at the complexities of homelessness, it's like, well, do you understand that in order for them, like let's say they manage to, you know, get an interview with somebody, right? They still have to give those people an address in order to know, like, where they can send their paycheck to, right? Especially if they don't really have a bank. And even that. Do you understand you need an address for a bank account? It's like, well, they have online banks. Okay, how do you suppose they get get online? <laughs> how do you suppose they do that? It's like you start looking at stuff. There are things that we that we have that we take for granted every day until you don't have it. So you find yourself in a position where you are without, and then it's like, whoa, man. So God had had that set up to where he made sure that everybody had, right? Now, here's here's the thing that, you know, God brought back to my memory was First John chapter 4, verse 8, because I'm currently uh, studying that now, where John says that he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And that word love is the word agape, which in the plural means like a love feast. Not, you know, I don't know why I feel like I need to say that, but not in the way, not in a perverted or demented way. Talk about you have so much love in you that it's like if we had a dining table that was set for like hundreds of thousands of people, everybody could not only eat at that table and sit down and eat something at that table, they could go back for thirds. They would have take-home plates. And that was another thing about this culture, right? Hebrew culture, you had to have enough. You had so much food left over that people would leave with food, and then even those people, like the stranger, right, the poor, whoever, they would give it away. So they had food to eat. So if you didn't have enough food for all them people, it was like, oh, you, you know, your party was trash, basically. <laughs> you were not hospitable. Like, that that was really a disgrace. That was shameful. And so it's like, what are you leaving behind? Whether it's to your, your natural children or your spiritual children, what are you leaving behind? Because a lot of us come from families where we have a lot of general, generational curses. 
right? You're leaving behind poverty. You're leaving behind bitterness. You're leaving behind addictions. You're leaving behind unhealthy lifestyles, right? Where people, you know, bad eating habits or whatever. And now, well, you know, we we diabetic. No, actually, actually though, you can change it. You can turn that around. But you have a bad, you know, unhealthy habit, lifestyle habit, but you can turn that around. It's not that you have it. And then I also learned, right, that eventually if you continue down a healthy road, that gene that's in you, it will eventually just, God will, it's gone, right, because you have continued and you've passed down those healthy things for so long that the gene is no longer there, right? So, again, spiritually, what are you leaving for people? If somebody was to take your love and put it on a dinner table for 100 people, would 10 people even be able to get a plate? It's something to to think about. Like, not just naturally, what are you leaving? How are you being charitable and, and kind and loving and godly? Spiritually, how do you apply these things in your life? I don't know. It's interesting, like I said, to see these things because often it's the reverse. Instead of clinging to, you know, trying to uphold that union, I often see where the the spouse, one or the other, is putting the family before before everybody else. It's like, but what did God say, though? What did God say? Right? Instead of clinging to wisdom, you leave the wisdom behind. I'm going to just handle it my way. And then you, instead of leaving behind the wrath and the anger, you hold, you staying in there, just staying in there and end up doing something really foolish and evil. You're sitting there, you're holding it, you focus so focus on your enemies. And it's like, man. Oh, my God. And you, you quit before the battle is over. And then it's like, but the Lord, like, they're not even going to be here by that next time around. You sitting here worried about them, and they're not even, you're, and they're going to be cold. But you're still going to be here. Like, I got you. Just ask me. And even when it feels like, again, you in that moment, like, man, God must not care. And it's like, care for what you're saying over yourself. Because the enemy will get in your head real quick and have you just talking nonsense. I had a dream recently. And in that dream, again, God was showing me myself, where it was like, you didn't even take time. There was a young woman in the dream. Now, true enough, you know, she was... Uh, I think she had a, a she was a recovering alcoholic, and she had just made like a month or two sober or something. It wasn't that long, but then she said something kind of dangerous, like, "Oh, I'm gonna do it by myself." And both me and some other people, we all looking at her like, "Whoa, <laughs> wait, that's a bad idea. What are you doing?" And she came, she, the reason she said it, it was coming from a place of hurt because she was like, every single person I've had in my life has betrayed me. They left me out to dry. They left me. And because of them, I ended up falling back into alcoholism. So it's like, you know what, I'm going just, to just hang out by myself. Now, in the dream, you know, looking back, like I said, it was a dream, but it was just like, notice how, and the Lord pointed it out to me, notice how you did not respond to her in love. Like, yeah, the things you were saying were true, but you didn't say it in love. You did not handle her in love, right? You were so busy trying to be little Miss Know-it-all. Like, I'm right, you know, and I, I'm going to you know, make my point. And it's like, at the cost of what? Because then toward the end of the dream, the girl went and locked herself away in her room. She ended up cutting herself off from everybody entirely. It's like, you see what happened there? <laughs> if you had just taken the time to listen and hear her out before you started condemning her, that probably would have went a lot better 
to what you did. And so literally the Lord's like, now think about how you do that in your everyday life. Do you actually take time to listen to what people are telling you, to listen to their heart? Or are you just waiting for them to stop talking so that you can make your point? Because that's not, that's not handling people in love, right? Remember, what are you leaving them? What are you leaving behind for people to, to gather, to glean? If your vineyard spiritually, right, do you, even, do you even have any grapes for them to gather? Do you even have a harvest by yourself? Like, <laughs> really? Or is it just withered? Tangled up, neglected vines with all these branches, right? We talked about that, right? How when you grow a vine, a grapevine, they have to use prunes, the pruning shears, the little hand shears to prune. But if it gets neglected and there's like all these wooden branches that just completely engulf the vine, that's when they have to come in with the big shears to start chopping things away. Do you even have anything for people to gather? Or is it just a bunch of dangled up, tangled up vines? You know? So, y'all, I hope that this time around, right, I took my time. I'm hoping this time is like, I hope, I'm hoping that you kind of see it like I see it, at least for myself. Like, okay, Lord. So I'll be like, okay, if nobody else got the I got it. And I just pray that somebody else got it too, but really take time. Like I, as I keep saying to you all, right, really take time and go read. At least read it for yourself. Because I just I don't know. Like, I don't know how unless you're just really – in that in that place where it's just like, well, you know, God, yeah, he's cool, but I'm not. It's like, okay, so you, you kind of like him, but you're not in love with him. And if that's really where you're at, then pray that God would change that too. I literally have to start praying like, God, I want you to be the love of my life. I want to get to a place where I'm just madly in love with you. That I love you more than anyone else. Because I have to, I have to have that. I have to be there. I have to. That's the that should be the goal for all of us. Not just because you know, oh well, of course you're saying that because you're the Bible study. No, like I'm saying that because I believe in Jesus Christ, and that should be the desire for all of us, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want my heart to be set on Him, in the one in heaven, because that's where I also want to be. What I'll leave here. What a shame it would be to, to do all these lessons and still not make it because my heart was still set on all these idols on earth. Okay, I'm gonna stop. But next time, okay, we're gonna look at that word preserve. Right? So we looked at the word forsake. And we're going to look at the word preserve. That was the one where I had to, I got to a part, one of the definitions, I had to pause. And I said, ooh, wow. Okay, God. It just gets better and better from here. <laughs> but for now, we're going to stop because, ooh, child, I'm, okay, I'm over time. Y'all know, y'all already know. But. Like I said before, I genuinely do hope that y'all got something from this lesson. Okay, and if you did, share it with somebody else. If you don't do nothing else, share it with somebody else, or you know, even share the video. If you like me, you get all nervous, like, Ugh, like that happened to me today. Like I still have those moments. I'm sitting there listening to a song, and I'm like, man, this song is really ministering, and the Lord's like, share it with them, them, them. You know, and I shared it to like two of the people that he told me to because I'm like, man, Lord, I don't know. I'm I'm scared. He's like, girl, if you don't share that song, don't share the song with the people I told you to share with. 
So at least share share a word with them because you don't know where somebody is in their season in their life, and they might need a word too. You know, we can't be stingy with the love feast. We can't be stingy with the, with the Lord. Like, you should have a desire to, anyway, let me stop. Let me go in first. So, Lord God, I want to thank you once again for another day, for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord God. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for your wisdom, for godly wisdom, um, God, that you are the one who protects us, who keeps us, God. You provide increase. You are our provider. You build us from the inside out. And even when it feels like nothing is changing, like nothing's happening or things aren't moving fast enough, everything is going according to your perfect plan and your purpose, your timing. And you're always on time. So, God, we thank you for that. God, I pray that you just continue to increase in us, to grow us, God, to mold us and shape us to the women of God that you've called us to be. And, Lord, I pray that there would be something that you just continue to move on us to just share your word, to share your truth, to plant a seed, to water a seed in somebody else. Because we don't know what storm somebody is going through. And we're either in a storm, coming out of one, or about to go into one. That's a constant. But you are also constant in that you do not change. And we can trust you to be faithful, to walk with us through our storms, to be with us through anything, Lord God. So we thank you and we praise you for that. Lord, we love you. I ask that you just guard our hearts and our minds throughout the week, throughout this season, Lord God. Remind us of your promises that we are not forsaken, even if it feels like it. We are not forsaken by you, God. We are loved and adored by you. And I pray, Lord, that at the end of this season, that we would have a harvest that is so great, so great in us, that we have to just give it away. That people can come and glean from our vineyard and eat at our tables and feel the love of God in their life. In Jesus' name I pray, thank God, and amen. All right, ladies. <laughs> You'll take care. Be sure to join us on Thursday for Everybody Bible Study at the same time, 730. All right, y'all. Take care and God bless. Bye.